great. So we are live. Thank you so much, Shireen, for joining me today. As we were just saying, we have not caught up in a while, and I find it really interesting to have people that I know, that I know a little bit of what they do, but to delve a little bit further on what's currently happening. And I thought um, you have a lot of experience to share with us. Um, you have had corporate experience. You, are, you also have done consulting and coaching on your own. So we are going to delve into those subjects. But before we go into that, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your career in HR. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Yes, Rose, gosh, it was years ago that we connected and I still remember the time that we did. I was actually at such a crossroads, you know, mm -hmm. in my career and, and in my life. And it's so lovely to connect with you again and sort of come full circle. Um, but yeah, for those who are tuned in or for those who are going to listen to the replay, um, I'm Shireen, as Rose introduced, and I have uh, just over two decades of sort of HR experience. Um, and within that two decades, 15 years was uh, solely focused on sort of corporate HR. And then when we had met, I'd reached a crossroads in my career and I wanted some variety and I pivoted into, into coaching. So I did a qualification. Um, and so, yeah, 20 years later, I have the 15 years of corporate HR and then the last five years is sort of HR consulting together with sort of my coaching practice. So ultimately, my work lies at the intersect or my HR work between sort of HR strategy and operations and, and coaching. Yeah, yeah. And I, I find that part, you know, HR strategy really interesting, especially as we were saying on the corporate side, because I what we do as a consultancy is usually small to medium sized businesses. And it would be really lovely to explore, you know, how different it can look when you are in corporate or how similar it might look as well. So mm -hmm. that's something that I'm, I'm really curious about and keen to hear your insights on that. Mm -hmm. And cool. So um, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit of what are those issues that team members have faced in 2023 and this is from your you know all walks of paths of you know that you've been on last mm -hmm. year what was you know what were team members facing in 2023 what issues sure um i think maybe just an overarching i guess sort of themes i would start off with and then i'll go sort of into specific issues I think the um, the extensive experience that I've had in HR over the past few years has really provided me with quite valuable insights into the evolving landscape, um, you know, of HR and just the professional world in ge in general. Um, you know, so apart from I guess a, a strategic way of thinking um, and then operationalizing that, it really is also complemented by um, an attitude of adaptability or a competency because things change all the time right in today's working world with tech and and all sorts of things we're going to discuss later and then secondly i think is also a really deep understanding of both the organization but also the human elements at play so you know i've seen firsthand sort of the increasing challenges that professionals needed to navigate in the working world so i really think those sort of are the fundamentals but back to your question in terms of my experience what sort of team members um had faced sort of last year leading into this year is really that the working world i think we can all agree no matter what the size of business it's, it's become quite volatile and, and complex and like how do we navigate you know in that environment um and then also you know the big thing there is or the fundamental thing is leading through change you know how do we continuously lead when we ourselves are going through the change trying to understand the implications of changes globally locally the workforce um, and how do we keep leading through that, you know, coupled with um, digital transformation, it's big and it's throughout the value chain uh, within the workforce, you know, job titles, traditional job titles are changing, um, you know, organizations, the kinds of work that we do are changing and how we operate and engage the workforce is changing. So digital transformation is big. 
Um, a third component, I would say, is also the complexity of having to adapt and learn to work with a multi-generational workforce. Mm. You know, it's interesting to, to know that currently we have Gen Zs entering the workforce and then that brings with it a whole different set of expectations, right? A whole different set of culture and, and also work life. And so what are the expectations of sort of the older generations with the new workforce, you know, at play? Um, I think uh, another one for me would, would be wellness. Um, I've seen firsthand, you know, with all these rapid changes and adapting and learning and pivoting, um, that mental health is a very, very big theme um, and a priority for, um, for the workforce. Um, we've certainly worked on a lot of sort of wellness programs that are quite um, um, relevant, you know, and hopefully as the conversation evolves, maybe we can touch on some of those uh, sort of wellness sort of like I like to call it the, the faux or, or, um, and real wellness. What is real wellness? You know, it's not just taking that break or leave from work when you need it, um, but it's really working on mindset and heart set. But as I said, sort of, you know, maybe we'll get into that as the conversation evol evolves. I think the last two points for me, those would be, um, you know, the whole concept of work life um, integration, because as we know, balance doesn't exist. We will find ourselves at peaks and troughs at different points, you know, or seasons in our careers or within business or times of the year. But it really is the concept of how do we balance the work-life integration, especially now that remote work, you know, our places of home have become our places of work, etc. Um, and also with the return to work, how are we integrating all of that? And I think my last response to your question on, on issues is... Um, Perhaps culture, you know, I think diversity and belonging uh, as globalization, we have people working different parts of the world, uh, whether it's small organizations or bigger organizations, or whether we're working remote or in office, um, really the focus on diversity and belonging and, and managing team members, of different generations, different backgrounds, different cultures and varying locations. So, you know, it really a lot um, that is at play but it's also you know it's cutting edge it's, it's exciting because it's really the evolution of work and we are part of shaping and and informing what that looks like what is fit for purpose for our business and for our people yeah i hear you it's so interesting to hear because um again going back to dif that differentiation of like corporate and small medium-sized business environment you, when, when it comes to small to medium sized businesses, it's a very like, you know, we're here for a mission, you know, this is what we want to accomplish. And you get a, you know, a financial package at the end of the month. And that's kind of like, you know, and we roll. But when it comes to corporate, there is so much that corporate considers, you know, in terms of like wellness programs, benefits, and th there's, there's a lot much more that comes into that kind of employee experience. And obviously, small to medium sized businesses have some of these things but not as fully fleshed as a corporate will have um the type of benefits that they have and just the way they think of um employees and and that as you said life work integration um mm -hmm. so that's definitely you know a difference i guess also what corporates have there to their advantage is that if they're a corporate is because they they manage a certain status growth volume and now they have this the um, advantage to be able to provide that as a competitive advantage to their workforce to retain people and to make sure that they're taking care so there's almost like more responsibility over taking care over staff members as opposed to a small to medium-sized business that is more like you know on the go making things happen if that makes sense mm -hmm. what i'm saying yes Yes, um, absolutely. But I think there are, I think there are pros and cons to, to both bigger organizations. You know, I think sometimes the challenge working for multinationals or big local organizations is, I think there is the idea that there is security. But in my experience, there's been lots of right sizing and reorganizing the business to remain agile and competitive, because I think smaller businesses are coming in at potential 
potentially leaner costs, leaner workforce, and are nimble enough to change and can adapt quite quickly, right? So I think to remain competitive, um, it definitely, in my experience, I've seen quite a bit of volatility. I've seen a lot of large corporations. Um, one of the corporations I've worked with, we've gone through downsizing exercises probably every two years, 18 years to two months, which is significant. So I think the idea of security, but there's also, you know, the internal narrative, like, am I secure in the role that I have? I know I have the benefits, but, you know, also, am I relevant enough in terms of my skill set? Am I working for an organization that has relevant skills that the rest of the market, you know, allows? allows me to be employable. Um, and yeah, I mean, with smaller businesses, they definitely, I think the opportunity to double hat, um, to move into different roles, to feel recognized quite easily and quickly, um, and to have touch points with different players in the organization for influence. I think it definitely comes with those benefits. Um, so it really does depend. I mean, as I said, I do career coaching and that's often, you know, I often have people um, approach me because they want a career shift or change. Mm -hmm. And we often need to explore why and what are the values, you know, what is it that they're looking for? And sometimes a smaller, leaner business is, is really what is good for them. It suits mm -hmm. the persona, not just the skill set. And sometimes mm -hmm. there are others who are just built for corporate. They build for the dynamics that corporate come with. You know, they build for, yeah, whatever corporate has to offer, um, and maybe even the security. But I would, I would say that, yeah, in my experience, it's not always the sense of of safety and security. I have a lot. In fact, most of my clients are actually corporate professionals who do feel sort of you know, threatened in their place of work in that they don't necessarily have the stability they had. And I think that's all the bits that we've been talking about in terms yeah. of just, um, yeah, volatility and change socially and economically. I hear you because I think what happens at, in corporate as well, which is almost uh, kind of innate to the human nature, is that there's probably a narrative always playing in your mind because there's there's so much going on, so many people around you that it's yeah. natural to compare, to always yeah. try to yeah. like, okay, and then am I keeping? And I guess that when it comes to small to medium sized businesses, people are super peer focused on like we need to make this happen and things so much more applied. So so that that is definitely interesting to hear. And um, and then tied with with. Uh, you know, the issues that people face in 2023. I'd love to know what what ideas do you have for corporations to implement um, and to enhance the employee experience in 2024? What are those kind of like um, inspirations or insights that you have for um, your companies in 2024? Yeah, I think it's a, such a good question, Rose, because I really do believe that the employee satisfaction really plays such a crucial role and sort of the success and the sustainability of the organization, right? And and that experience is more than just a feel-good factor because it really does impact your bottom line in terms of productivity, retention, and your overall business health. Mm -hmm. um, so in my experience, again, um, you know, there is the increased need uh, to focus on employees' needs. Um, and there are increasing mechanisms to do that, right? So we see employers providing various channels of feedback, and whether that's through surveys, uh, similar organizations like yourself, pulse surveys that are ongoing, right? There's opportunity for that feedback consistently or to hear employees' needs through even mentoring programs and conversations, even coaching. I work with a lot of organizations where coaching, you know, in a feedback report, um, we have themes coming through on what's being shared. Um, there's focus groups, there's participation in forums. So there really are lots of mechanisms that I think employers are increasingly trying to create to understand what what are those evolving needs, right? And it's so different, like I said, with different ge uh, generations um, and even within different organizations and contexts. I think the other thing for me that is important to enhance specifically for HR from an employee experience is also, is the operating model fit for purpose? right does it also need to adapt according to the changing business needs and landscape um, we've seen lots of again in my experience HR teams becoming more lean with the adoption of a lot of technology but also what is fit for purpose what is the business trying to achieve and how is HR enabling the business in achieving that 
Um, we've seen autonomized um, sort of learning. So where it's relevant, people really need to kind of um, adopt um, learning. It's modernized. A lot of organizations can tap into third party platforms where people are learning in their own time, at their own pace and when they have that availability. Um, and I mean, similar to, I guess, our exchange, you know, I can't really see how many people have joined, but I'm sure in my experience, if I can't join in the present moment, I can always go back to go and learn and catch up on what it is that, that I want to learn. And I have that influence in terms of what it is that I feel is important for me, you know, in the context of my role and my job. I think what is also important to people is that um, policies that are introduced within organizations are not only equitable, but, you know, they they're sustainable and also, I think, responsible to the local nuances. You know, we have global challenges and then we also, if you're working for a multinational and then we also have local challenges, um, you know, that we need to overcome. So what are the policies that we need to look at and constantly reevaluate that they mm -hmm. are for purpose, right? Um, we spoke about, I think, diversity and inclusivity. Um, you know, a lot of what I've experienced is organizations starting a lot of employee resource groups. So it's little communities for marginalized groups. So we've had, I mean, in South Africa, in the context that we have with employment equity, we've got a lot of employment equity forum groups. Um, in some organizations, because they're trying to elevate or equate um, equality in terms of gender, we formed groups with leader, women in leadership, right? Mm. Um, there's also books and we discuss what's topical in terms of being a mum, being a professional, you know, having to balance work-life balance and there's books and there's forums, but it really is a space where people can feel they are part of something, but also part of, you know, a bigger organizational uh, a goal. And I think lastly, but also quite importantly, is just pay equity um you know are people being paid for the contributions are they market related pay um you know in the context of the size of the business and what the business can afford and also you know equity and sort of performance management systems in place how are we making sure that it's fair that it's equitable and that we can retain sort of good staff um because yeah i've worked with incredible people who you know money is definitely a factor when it comes to job satisfaction and and the employee experience so also as a retention mechanism you know and if it can't be paid what other alternatives are the organizations introducing and being quite transparent you know i've worked with a particular organization where they were very open stating that they are aware given um the size of the business and where they are in their growth curve that they don't pay the best salaries however these are the opportunities and the options that they do reinvest in their staff um and they were very open and transparent about that right so when it came to staff surveys and questions were asked about that i think people were very clear on on why it is that they joined the organization and what makes them stay. Yeah. Oh, I mean, so many things to unpack there. Um, oh. I love it. the one thing that, that you mentioned gave me this feeling of like, there's, it's a, almost like a trend in 2024 for HR to focus on that uh, to craft the employee experience. So it's like personalized. It's per person, yes. how you want yes. them to experience work based on their needs. So as you said, hearing uh, first from them what the needs are through surveys mechanisms or feedback loops and then to have a um, technology supporting that that particular way this person wants to uh, to go through the employee experience be it through learning at their own pace at their own time on the subjects that they want you probably just make available the um like the 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 those academies that provide you know a lot of different training so they can focus and then the role there for hr is to be like cool you've done all of these courses it looks like you're very steering towards wanting to learn you know more about marketing right and and then for hr to craft career to where the person wants to go so it's it's really what i like to call it is like T turning the narrative around or the conversation around where it is the employee in charge of leading that growth and um, when it comes to performance yeah I, I see it with performance management uh, which is the one that we focus most on to not not the manager to start the conversation not even HR employee you tell us 
about you know your quarter in review and to really put it on on them to tell us how they're doing it really changes that mindset of like you know it's on you and hr is there to facilitate the same as the manager and um, but to kind of craft that employee experience and then the other thing that resonated with me from what you said uh you know this difference in between the corporate environment and small to medium sized businesses is that Corporates and multinationals also will um, look at how they work in regions, right? So in, in order to cascade down those uh, global HR strategies or global growth, you will still look at the regions, for example, pay quality, right? Like you can't really have a blanket rule global because you actually are working on different regions. So, you know, it works, I guess, like um, subunits. And that's where... Uh, the local, as you said, that, that local environment will define a lot of the things that how they get done in that particular region, not only from a compliance point of view, but also from like, you know, we hear these are the challenges that people like low shedding. I'm sure there was some things that, you know, regionally had to be, you know, kind of be custom made for South African, uh, you know, entities uh, from multinationals. So, Absolutely. Yeah, so that's that's really interesting to hear. So I guess there's both. There's the global trends, some things that can come directly, like, okay, that's that's the way it is, but others that actually it's the local, you know, regional entity that has to actually tell the kind of, you know, global branch, you know, how things yeah. need to be done. Absolutely. I mean, a good example, maybe just to illustrate, um, you know, for those interested, either working in a multinational or looking to transition, is that um, from a global, one of the organizations that I work with, from a global perspective, gender equity is a key driver. So a lot of the activities are centered around how are we making sure that we have an equal, you know, this parity between male and females. Um, and then in the South African context, we've got an additional layer with employment equity, right? So how do we employ people from marginalized groups? How do we make sure that we have, according to the, you know, legislated standard that we've got people of color, female, male, and, you know, in the different, um, in the different ethnicities. So then we would be... Um, Maybe bound is a strong word, but I guess we would be compelled from a legislative requirement. And of course, it's the right thing to do, right? Your workforce needs to represent, I guess, um, you know, the, the data in terms of the, of the country. And so then we would have that additional layer, which would then be very different to what the global standard is. However, you know, as an overarching theme, a local HR um, uh, uh, you know, sort of expert is accountable for any reputational and financial, you know, harm that yeah. the business uh, could face or penalties. So yeah. you would make sure that the local regulatory requirements, you comply with that together with rolling up, you know, in towards the bigger uh, global group um, directives. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting to hear because it's like leveraging based of both worlds where there's some global trends that obviously for the greater good the company wants to you know cascade down but then there's like the expertise required regionally that you need to abide by and you leave the person the people in that region to be in charge of that um it's so funny that you mentioned employment equity i just want to mention this that we recently experienced um we were doing our reporting for one of our clients and as you said, we need to try match or have targets that are related to demographics and national level and also provincial level. And in our forecast for what we were going to plan forward, we actually had to um, reduce representation of minority groups because we had to. So we, let's say we were better, right, than the what That's the. That's a good position national. to be in. You were ahead of the curve. <laughs> And the advice from the company that we were doing the submission with was like, in your plan for the next year, you need to reduce. And it's like, this is so counter. Like, we wow. should be great. We should be raising the level. But we yeah. actually yeah. don't know. You have to reduce. I guess there was a compensation. So we have to reduce some minority for other. But still, it, it was like, this, this was interesting, you know, something interesting to experience. Wow. And... 
But yeah, I'd love to touch base a little bit on what, from all the experience that you have from the, the coaching and working with employees in corporate, what are the key aspects that make someone happy at work that you have identified? Yeah, you know, I think the, the added layer of my coaching work, it always humbles me because I really get to, to hear the heart and mind of, of what people are challenged with, you know, in different industries. And I work with different levels of people, whether they're starting their career and they need a bit of clarity or whether it's, you know, a senior leader and they're really challenged, but, you know, just being vulnerable in the work context. And we work together to overcome that. This is such a good uh, a question because, you know, sometimes I think we we complicate something that is so simple, but also sticking to simplicity is sometimes hard. I mean, for me, there are sort of five key, I would say, themes in terms of what creates that job satisfaction, what people genuinely want. And, you know, I'll, I'll go into each one a little bit in more detail, but I think it's just, you know, there's a quote that says being clear is being kind. And when we say being clear, that is from goal setting to a job profile to telling someone in an interview exactly what they would be accountable for, to giving, you know, performance feedback that is firm but fair, sharing areas of development and improvement. You know, that's what I refer to when I talk about clear communication. What is the intent? What is the strategy? Where is the business going? And continuously communicating that. People really need that clarity because I think when you are operating in your day-to-day -day job you know it's sometimes hard to see the wood from the trees and you you're just busy doing the day-to-day -day, but you really need that consistent communication coming through in terms of what are we driving what are we trying to achieve how are we, are we evolving the second thing I believe is autonomy the third thing is people want to know if they're doing their job well are they making a positive contribution the fourth thing I would say is people are continuously wanting to learn, or for the most part, you know, they're wanting to learn, they're wanting to pour in. People are curious beings. Your high performers, you also need to consistently stimulate them because they always are going to wanting to be working on the next thing or something new or something different. And then, of course, recognition, um, you know, just for, for contributions that are being made. Um, if we talk, if I just go a step back, maybe a bit more detail regarding autonomy. So, with regards to autonomy, I think people really want to have the opportunity to, to be contributors, but also how do I choose how I contribute? So my work-life integration, does that mean I can do remote work remotely? Does that mean I can do a compressed working week? Does that mean I can have flexible start and end times? People really want to influence that given you know the reality and the generations that we're working with. Um, and then also you mentioned something earlier where you said, you know, um, people are taking the lead. You know, I want to evolve. I want to do this, etc. Uh, there's an organization I worked with and I really loved this one liner that they had. They said everyone in the organization is a leader. It was called lead from every seat. And so it was never only leadership's responsibility, but lead from every seat meant that you lead your growth and development you lead your progress, you know, you lead what you want to participate in, you lead the evolution of where you're wanting to go within the organization. So I really believe that autonomy for me, there's two aspects, it, you know, it's the work-life integration, and then also we are all leaders in our own right, whether it's an entry-level position, but we really are lead, we can lead from every seat. Um, the, uh, the next point, like I said, is doing, doing your job well. Uh, people need to know that. People need to know, are they contributing well? Are they doing well? You know, are they making a positive contribution? Am I adding value? Do I feel accomplished in, in what it is that I'm doing? And also, am I part of something significant? You know, you often, I find a lot of younger people uh, get to a crossroads in their career because they want to do something purposeful or meaningful. Um, you know, yeah, so so that is very, very important. And also, you know, positive contribution could also mean working within the organization, but doing things outside of their job. You know, there are different communities there. You know, it could be the social aspect of of the team that you're running within the business. It could really it, it must be meaningful for you. And that's how you can sort of contribute. Um, and then we spoke about the learning piece. I mean, am I learning, growing? I think that's sort of quite self-explanatory. But it's not just learning. It's am I feeling challenged? Um, am I feeling challenged in what it is that I'm doing? Um, and also what people are interested in. It's, it's quite fascinating. But 
in my experience, we hired a third party, or I work with a third party organization where we surveyed uh, people internally within this organization, and it was specifically on the topic of learning and development. And a lot of people, interestingly enough, were not wanting to pursue ongoing studies in their field of work, but they had totally different aspirations. We saw people were interested in um, it was people in finance, for example, who were interested in doing a course in data analytics. Um, they were not wanting to progress their studies purely in finance. So we're really seeing a hybrid of what people are curious in, but also we are, you know, opportunities and jobs within the organization and outside. What is that leading to? And people have a big curiosity around, you know, trying to do something that they've never tapped into, but getting curious about it. So, you know, it's it's what does the organization, where is it evolving into? And do we see this as a skill or a role in the future? And how can I equip myself to be in the best position when the opportunity lands? Um, and then the last point, like I said, is recognition, you know, which is two things we really, I think, again, in my coaching conversations, as leaders, as HR professionals, we really underestimate the lack or the impact of the lack of appreciation um, does and the toll it really takes on employees' morale. Um, you know, high-performing people especially, they give their best, they sometimes outwork themselves, and we don't always see, you know, the day-to-day -day or the grinding or the after-hours contributions that are made. Um, and that recognition could be, you know, we could have mechanisms where it's peer-to-peer -peer recognition, it could be performance-based recognition, it could be public, you know, acknowledgement with awards, um, and then the other aspect is obviously just competitive and, and equitable pay practices. So that's where, you know, people really, really want um, the, the contribution. Yeah, I mean, that was a mouthful. But to sum it up, I think it's very much clear communication, autonomy, feeling valued for the work, positive contributions they're making. Are people learning and growing? And then how are they feeling recognized? For me personally, I think those are the five primary things that that really pour into someone's happiness factor at work. Yeah, I, I really resonate with the points that you chose. And I feel like, you know, when you were speaking about autonomy, autonomy has these two things where there's that freedom of choice, right? For you yeah. to, to uh, pave your own path. But at the same time, there's, there's that responsibility and accountability for it, right? Because if you choose, but then you kind of, you are not aligned, then that's not gonna go down well. Uh, so it, it does, um, tied up with that point of like crafting, you know, your career. And you also mentioned, you know, in terms of um, the, um, you mentioned autonomy and you also mentioned uh, after the, was it the, the learnings, the insights on yes. learnings that people wanted to move different directions. And so that also tells you internal movement in companies that for companies to allow for that to happen. So people can really like um, craft, you know, where they want to go. Um, so yeah. It, it's interesting now, what do you think from, from if you work in corporate, like what's the ratio of HR team members per, for staff members to be able to, and obviously maybe you want to add also the enablement through technology, but like yeah. to be able to focus, to be able to have that, um, I guess, guided approach for each staff member and, and have yeah. all the benefits available to them. What's that ratio? This is a like, great question to us because I'm probably going to give you an answer that maybe contradicts each other. So the last time I checked, the ratio was about one HR resource to about 100, you know, employees. And I've worked in context where it's been much more employees to an HR, you know, subject matter expert or resource. However, I found myself also working for organizations where the headcount doesn't matter because it depends on the complexity of what it is that you are managing. So if you are managing employees or accountable, not managing, in different parts of the world, right? It could be six um, in you know Asia. It could be five in Europe. It could be the complexity that it involves because when you're doing a right-sizing or downsizing, Labor laws are completely different, right? Pay practices are completely different. Each location has its own nuances. So, you know, it really does depend on the geographical locations that you're managing. 
um, and the dynamics that go with that because it's a completely different culture. Yes, there's an overarching organizational culture, but you know the, the heartbeat of the business is the leadership within that space, within that location. So it really, really, you know, that earlier, as I mentioned, your HR operating model um, really has to be fit for purpose in terms of how you dedicate resources um you know and also as an hr professional you also have to i guess be quite measured because when you're managing multiple locations and i've done in the past before with i've had at some stage five ceos and um four different business no four different countries five different ceos and each one believe that you are only dedicated to their business mm -hmm right because they needed you full time or that you know there was a bit of competition but this business is getting more hr resource and attention and you know so you always also have to be measured in terms of what is your capacity right it's like running a business and how do you segment how do you allocate uh, resources that are that are available what can you capitalize and leverage across all the businesses but also you know what's going to be nuanced where do you pay attention so you also have to have sort of a boundary or just the self-awareness on how you manage that yeah yeah i agree with you and you know when you were mentioning those things we i was looking at how we operate because we're consultancy and we work with small businesses but if you think about it you could think of a it's a corporation that we work for. yeah absolutely absolutely and, and the way we have structured our consulting services, and um, you know, we had to look at you know the growth that adding more clients in, but how do we keep that? Um, the fact that we have such a good pulse on the floor of what happens with everybody, right. and it's so interesting because exactly. you know when we do our our internal meetings to just discuss client work. Uh, it's just you know you actually discuss people. So although you have you're in the south and in terms of employee base that that you cater for, we still discuss people. So that that human yeah. element, right? Like, yes, I saw the feedback from this person. Did we connect with the manager? Was something done there? This person, you know, like mentioned that they're going through this, and you still discuss on that level, which I think is you know you have the technology to enable and help you maybe to see where you need to focus but you still need okay. to have that kind of like conversation to happen awesome. and maybe to the first point that you were making you know that kind of clear and um, is everybody clear on what's going on right i think that mm. to me i always say i as hr like my main thing is when i go to my client and i i open the door i look at everybody I know how everybody's doing somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that I connect with them on a daily basis, but I, you follow on that journey that they're going through. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting something to keep in mind. The the functions that we have managed to let's say centralize um, are the legal proceedings and recruitment. Those two you could have specialized so that you know it can happen at a bigger scale, but then yeah. that. Part of the retention part is the one that needs a lot of focus, like you need much more uh, personalized approach to make Agreed. sure that you're you know, doing a good job. Agreed. A hundred percent agreed. Um, I also think that's why in a few of the organizations I've also worked in, um, because it's that high touch personalization, they've also introduced um, sort of coaching. It used to be coaching for only senior leaders, but also coaching um, through subject matter experts or people of high potential, high performance, um, you know, that middle layer, because it's also, it's so nuanced and it's personal, right? To each one, it's different. So it's meeting you where you at and supporting you in that journey to what it is that you're wanting to become. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And, and I'd love also to hear from you in terms of what has been the biggest challenge that you have to overcome when working in HR and maybe specifically when we speak about that kind of corporate environment. Mm. Um, well, I think, um, you know, there, there are challenges, but I guess it's it's what keeps us on our toes. It's, it's what keeps us, I guess, activated and, you know, looking to see what, I guess, competitors are doing or me personally what other locations are doing with similar perhaps socioeconomic challenges have they done that before you know that's the that's I guess the benefit of working with a corporate organization is that somewhere through the value chain someone has 
dealt with a particular challenge or can contribute to thinking through something, which is, which is something that you know I personally am really grateful for because they've lived through that challenge and they've worked through that challenge within the organization. But I think some of the biggest challenges um, you know having to overcome within HR, and I think for most professionals today, leadership or people just working, is just the dynamic change and the nature of the workplace right that we are constantly facing and there's quite a few of them um you know so a personal experience as we started the conversation um, um uh, uh, you know rose was that we had met where i was in a crossroads uh in my career i had experienced burnout you know quite mm -hmm. severely um and i was at a crossroads where i knew that initially i thought it was the organization and i needed to shift and i thought but you know what going to an organization dealing with the same set of challenges and also coming with the energy of burnout is not going to represent that organization or the best of me well and i took a bit of time out and i needed to dig deep and i really found something that ignited my passion which was coaching um but then you know i work at the intersect of hr because i love both i love hr and i love coaching and so that's given me such new insights um working in hr i've got an additional lens and an additional layer and like i said i constantly hear the challenges not only within an organization but externally what people are experiencing so i would say you know some of the challenges is really is is especially me working with high performers who i can identify it's also making sure having that personal touch like who needs to be stretched and who do you actually need to um caution uh on the road to burnout right especially those a type high achievers um you know people can work themselves to the point of, of burnout and when you see the signs it's really being uh, having a close relationship with your people and seeing those signs and actually sometimes even forcing them to take a step back you know what i find personally um, when I'm being interviewed or when I'm partnering with an organization, I'm very curious to know who am I going to work with in terms of my direct report or leading me. Is, is this person good for my nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. Can I, and I interview them really well as much as they're getting to know me too. You know, I want to know their leadership style. I want to know what ticks them. I want to see this really good chemistry with our relationship because I think when there is, we do absolute magic. I think we make significant change and we both, you know, ignite one another with ideas and, you know, we can share that. And that energy is also expensed throughout the business and the organization and the value chain. So that for me is, is really important. Um, so just making sure that I also am aware of my own boundaries, but also, you know, when do I stretch and when do I seek a new challenge, but also when do I sort of pull back, go in to give more? Yeah. Um, yeah, I um, think that's related to the, you know, the work that we do in HR. If you compare that to other departments, we are literally mm -hmm. like, let's say, responsible or in charge of that employee experience. And that means that we hear about people's problems a lot, right? Because people people may come to you to say what a lovely employee experience HR is providing us. But <laughs> let's say people come to us mostly when there's issues, complex in nature people dynamics related. I think that um, when you're for too many years in HR, that can, all that burden of those people dynamics, they are in your shoulders. You know, you walk these yeah. journeys with people. So that can, because if you compare it to like, okay, what a finance department can face, what a marketing department can face. Yes, in terms of magnitude, you know, we, we give it validity. They also have things to solve, but I yeah. think they're very different in nature, right? When you, when, I guess, you're empathetic, which mostly HR people probably are, and um, and then you have to deal with people issues all the time. It, you you feel it, you really feel it. So I can understand, mm -hmm. you know, that break that you needed to kind of like, you know, refresh and yeah, absolutely. And it's so important. I mean, for all the HR experts you know, listening to the call, who's going to listen to the call, is that you energy is felt, right? So you give a lot of yourself. We are big contributors to the culture of the organization and we need to lead by example. So, you know, if we are rep a representation of, you know, a great organization to join and these are, this is, these are the reasons why you should join, we also need to emulate that, right? We are the example and we need to walk that talk. 
um, because we are the brand, we are the custodians of that brand. And so if we don't feel that authentically, and if we don't, you know, pour into ourselves so we can give to others, uh, people will feel that. People will feel the in, inauthenticity, you know, whether you're representing your business or whether it's a casual chat within the business or representing your business externally, people can really sense that. And that's sort of the driving force of also just in terms of your brand and value proposition, what attracts people to be interested in your business because you speak with such excitement and vigor and what the business is doing, you know, and how it's changing. But to your point, Rose, a hundred percent. I mean, we deal with all sorts of challenges and we also think about the people and the conversations we had long after, you know, the conversation had taken place. Where you have to lay people off, you know, not so long ago. We had to right size the business and lots of layoffs virtually. And I mean, you physically, the expression and you, you know, you're going through that experience with someone. Um, and also, you know, people often think, or, you know, since I've gone into coaching, it's so interesting hearing the perspectives of what people think about HR or of HR. You know, we only do what the boss says. When HR is in a meeting, you know, you're in trouble. You know, HR doesn't care. And it's, you know, it's, it's really been an eye opener because entering conversations, you know, I always lead with, with trying to ease people when the conversation to be had. If I've never met you before, I explain the context and also just get to know a bit about you and just, yeah, just personalize that, that conversation. Um, but yeah, I feel like I'm rambling, Rose, and your question was some of the challenges that I had to overcome. So, I mean, I answered one was just kind of just, you know, the dynamic changes in the workplace, but also something we touched on earlier is also, um, you know, that changing employee expectations. So with each generation, you know, with each, uh, with even gender, there's dynamics between, you know, what males are experiencing versus females versus a specific demographic uh, whether it be a particular race, whether it be a particular gender, whether it be a particular generation, it's so nuanced and so different. So that personalization in terms of managing you know, employees' expectations around even their career development, um, you know, something that we, we sort of discussed. Oh, have you lost me, Rose? No. The I attention is like, I lost you there for a second. Am I still on screen? Yeah, yeah, you are. Okay. Um, and just, yeah, the, I guess the retention piece, you know, um, the employees need for that ongoing engagement. Um, you know, how do you create that when you are also, you know, working in your specialization, but creating capacity and space for that engagement and for people to be heard? Um, the inclusivity piece, which is what we spoke about earlier. Um, you know, I think, also technology so how are we keeping up with technology advancements how are we also equipping the business with skills for the future we need to remain relevant and find skills now that the business needs but also how are we making sure that we're building for the future and then i would say um evolving regulations you know um that is also you know quite strategic hiring practices that you you need to make sure that you hire people and often we do hire for skill, but also what is the fit? What is the personality, right? Because that's actually the longevity if the person's going to be staying in your organization or not. And so I think as an HR, um, you know, specialist, um, whether you're junior, whether you're middle management, whether you're senior, it really is about staying informed about these trends um, and understanding what is the implications for both the employees of the business as well as the organization. And how do you then adapt to, to what these changes are? And as the HR expert, how do you figure out what is the most effective strategies in addressing those challenges for your business? Um, and how do you make it fit for purpose? I think that whenever I do consult in the first conversation, I think when people do hear that I have a corporate background and I'm working for smaller businesses, there's always a perspective of like, oh, no, but we don't want to do it the corporate way. And, you know, we really don't want to be too formal because this is how we've been doing it. And I absolutely agree. But it's just making sure that, you know, you are on top of trends, that you read those trends regularly. Um, and like I said, you are informed and how do you adapt to then that and personalize, you know, the solutions and make it fit for purpose for your organization. So yeah, yeah, that's that's what I would say in a nutshell. 
Yeah, I, I love what you have to share. And I can definitely see that, you know, obviously you have a wealth of experience from how many years you've been in the industry, how reassuring that is for, you know, the people that you work with when you come with that, you know, wealth of knowledge. And very interesting to hear, you know, the different um, the differences in between the corporate world and small to medium sized businesses, how HR has to mold different practices for, for the different um, business cases. Yeah, so it has been really great. I really appreciate your time and everything that we unpacked. I do think that, you know, people tuning in from the HR industry will definitely get a, a lot of insights. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I just want to thank you too for the energizing conversation. It was so good to see you after such a long time, Rose, and the amazing yes. things your business and your brand is doing. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Oh, thank you so much, Rui. We'll stay in touch. Thank you. Take care. Thank Go you. well, Rose. Bye. You too.